Good evening. It's November 30th, and that means the 2023 Atlantic hurricane season is officially over. I'm meteorologist Ryan Phillips. It's a collective sigh of relief that we're feeling around South Florida tonight as we made it through the season unscathed. The season, the season proved very active in terms of the number of storms, and this comes despite the presence of an intensifying El Nino, which typically results in less activity across the Atlantic. The presence of very warm sea surface temperatures turned out to be a major contributor to this season's storm development. So let's start tonight by taking a look at how the season wrapped up. First and foremost, when we look at our scorecard here, we look first to the total storms, 20 versus 14. So that in and of itself, obviously, look first to the total storms, 20 versus 14. So that in and of itself, obviously, tipping its hat to that, hey, this was an above average year, right? Then you go down to the hurricanes and major hurricanes, seven hurricanes, three major hurricanes, pretty much on the mark for what we would expect. But again, the development of 20 systems across the Atlantic Basin, mainly across the open Atlantic waters, certainly the telltale sign of what this season looked like with the activity that just kept going, but not immediately adjacent to the U.S. coastline. So we compare 2023 to more active seasons. Again, this is the fourth most active season ahead of it. Seasons you're very familiar with across the Atlantic and especially being a Florida resident. 2021, we had 21 named systems. Back in 2005, of course, with Katrina and Wilma making impacts here in South Florida, 28 named storms. And in 2020, 30 named storms. So this season's 20, ranking pretty high, but thankfully no direct impacts here in South Florida. Another metric we use to assess how active a season was is ACE, that is accumulated cyclone energy. And this metric takes into account the duration of the storm as well as the intensity of the winds. And so we ended up with the season with about 120% of normal activity on average across the Atlantic Basin for the season in its entirety. That metric would be about 121. And we were above average, of course, closer to 145. A busy season nonetheless. Look at where the storm tracks generally clustered though. You're thinking, man, maybe I didn't experience so many uh, bulletins in my neighborhood or my vicinity and bring it closer to home. Notice that big void across the Caribbean. That's typical. That is a, certainly a fingerprint of a strong El Nino year. And then of course we had some impacts here across the U.S. and bring it closer to home. We go in order here with Harold, Idalium and Ophelia. Harold, a tropical storm which brought significant impacts in terms of wind, rain and even a small surge, but it was a fast moving storm across South Texas. Adalia, major hurricane making landfall across the Big Bend of Florida. And then Ophelia, a tropical storm into the sensitive areas of North Carolina there in the Outer Banks. But again, dialing in here with major hurricane Adalia, ramping up to a Cat 4, making landfall as a Cat 3. And then might I add, taking impacts across Georgia and South Carolina before it moved offshore. So as I mentioned, we saw many systems this year, 20 as a matter of fact, while well, South Florida did not take a direct hit. Other parts of the state were not as fortunate. Hurricane Adalia hit the Big Bend region in late August, causing catastrophic damage in several rural counties. State officials say lessons learned from previous hurricanes has helped speed up the recovery process following Adalia. What surprised me, I would say, in Hurricane Adalia is how resilient this particular section of Florida is. Um, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of ask for us to come in and do extraordinary things. Um, a lot of people just, you know, pick up themselves by the bootstraps. Early projections put losses from Adalia at between three and $5 billion. By comparison, last year's Hurricane Ian, which impacted the Southwest coastline, projected with overall losses there of $112 billion, the costliest and state history. Well, let's go back to the spring. By the time April and May rolled around, chatter about this season's hurricane season, this year's hurricane season, we're already in full swing. There were two opposing forces that would be in play and have a significant influence on the type of season that would soon unfold. In the end, it was a busy season of name systems, but in places that did not threaten South Florida. Here's a look at how it all unfolded and the challenges this season presented to the National Hurricane Center. The 2023 Atlantic hurricane season began at a crossroads, matching a developing El Nino long associated with less active hurricane seasons 
against the background of very warm Atlantic Basin water temperatures. With these two competing forces, something had to give. When it ended, the season produced 20 storms, seven hurricanes, and three major hurricanes, ranking 2023 as the fourth most active season for total named storms. And lo and behold, we had a lot of activity. So the El Nino, even though it was present, it didn't have as much of an impact in suppressing the amount of activity that we had in the Atlantic. Robbie Berg is a senior hurricane specialist at the National Hurricane Center and said that this season, his 16th, was quite frustrating at times. Uh, the steering patterns this year weren't very pronounced, so we had a lot of storms that would move and kind of meander and wiggle and wobble across the Atlantic, and that made forecasting track of those storms pretty difficult. Surprisingly, South Florida never ended up in the forecast cone, unfazed by the active season. While on guard, not once did we have to act for a threatening storm. However, three landfalls did occur in the United States this season, with the most intense storm making landfall in the Big Bend of Florida, Major Hurricane Adalia, on the morning of Wednesday, August 30th. We knew days in advance before the storm hit Florida that rapid intensification was a distinct possibility. We had forecast the storm to become a major hurricane, uh, and that's what it did. It became a, uh, actually got to Category 4 strength, weakened just very slightly before landfall and came in as a major Category 3 hurricane. So I think being able to get that message out days before the storm event happened, it got the people in the Big Bend ready for that event. While the most tangible impact of Hurricane Nadalia was storm surge, it continues to be a product that the NHC is working towards improving its visibility and understanding. Dr. Cody Fritz is the head of the storm surge unit and is tasked with issuing all U.S. watches and warnings. It's also you know, how we communicate those events. So it's always the communication of the storm surge and making sure people um, are understanding exactly what we're saying. Um, not just when, but where, how high, what all of that means. Um, and I think especially to them, right, for anybody living along the coast. While storm surge watches and warnings are relatively new, first and we have to get even better at how we communicate um, these events. Um, and I think if we can do that, you know, we'll certainly start to help people have a better understanding of what it means, um, not just the event itself, like what the phenomena of storm surge is, but what it means for their community. And that's something both believe is a focus for their entire organization in the off season. And teach them about hurricanes, teach them how they should use our information and how we can essentially make the hurricane community stronger going into the next season. Now, Berg does add that he does not believe that a quiet season for South Florida will lull our senses. Rather, it would only make us more aware going into the 2024 season. All right, let's bring in NBC6 Hurricane Specialist John Morales for his perspective on this very active season. Mm -hmm. John, uh, you've seen a lot. What was different? What was unique to you about this season? I mean, so many angles and, and such a, a weird season, a surprising season. I think the most surprising thing is uh, seeing the record hot sea surface temperatures play such an important role in aiding in the development of such a large number of storms despite the El Nino. But at the same time, being able to thank El Nino because we had 20, 21 storms, but yet only seven became hurricanes. Listen. This season could have been a whole lot worse, Ryan, than it was because of the El Nino. Exactly. Now, uh, rapid intensification certainly showed its face in multiple storms this season. We know that we're getting better at seeing it. Certainly the National Hurricane Center, really good at forecasting it. Uh, but it's also something that we need to think about in the future, especially along the East Coast, anywhere really in sensitive uh, hurricane areas. No, well, I mean, more than ever. Yeah. More than ever. I mean, you know, one of the things that happened, we, we had, of course, Franklin, Idalia, and Lee all go through rapid intensification in the Atlantic, but it's happening with a lot greater ease all over the planet. In the Eastern Pacific, 80% of tropical storms this year ended up going through rapid intensification cycles, 80% of them. So. What's scary is, you know, we may not be necessarily be seeing more tropical storms all around the globe, but the percentage of them becoming Cat 4s and 5s is higher, and therefore we are going to see greater threats. Let's talk about this intersection now, then, between all of these climate signals that are clearly in front of us that are all playing a role. Then we add in the population distribution. A little bit closer to the coastline, certainly during COVID here in South Florida, we saw uh, nearly uh, 
an influx of over 300,000 new residents over the course of the few years. Are we reaching peak vulnerability now? I mean, let's, let's also think Idalia hit a very sparsely populated area of the right. state. That could have gone many different directions. Well, I mean, that's just the thing, right? I mean, if, if, if the cap fours and fives are the catastrophic hurricanes, and now they're happening with greater frequency, and now there are more things in harm's way because more people are moving towards the coast, even though they shouldn't, that continues to happen. Human nature, I do understand, but at the same time, it's risky. It's very risky. Look at what happened in Ian, right? So uh, I'm very concerned. There are limits to resilience. Uh, these climate signals you're talking about, it, it's not just the hot sea surface temperatures, it's the surging seas. Sea levels in Miami have risen a half a foot in 30 years. That plays a big role in how far inland the storm surge goes, how deep it's going to be. So the day we get a Cat 4 or 5 here, which could happen, it's happened in the past, it will happen again, it's going to be seriously catastrophic. And, and let's just jump over to the Eastern Pacific briefly uh, with Otis rapidly intensified, went into a, a metropolitan area. Uh, we are fortunate to have really stiff building codes here. That's not true across the entirety of the Gulf Coast or the East Coast. But why is that something we need to take a, a learn a lesson from, even though uh, our building codes are indistinguishable in terms of, of how the type of damage that they can produce? The building codes there in Acapulco are not clearly not to the level that we have here. But don't dismiss, don't look at that damage and say, oh, well, you know, their, their building codes aren't just as good. No, it's not just that. The winds were sustained at 165, gusting to 190, 200 miles an hour. How could you not see that type of damage there? And by the way, that one was not well predicted. I, I do right. have to get that in there. So imagine those poor folks in Mexico that uh, had to deal with this system almost without warning. We went through the season without being in the cone. What would you say to new residents to South Florida about the hurricane Well, season? don't get complacent, right? I mean, one of these days, and I'll say this very briefly, we'll, we'll get a storm joining us. Don't forget, you can always get your tropical updates and your local forecast anytime by using the NBC6 app. From our studios in Miramar, Florida, we say goodnight to you. On behalf of John Morales, I'm meteorologist Ryan Phillips.